appreciate that. And my name is Cheryl Clark. I'm with Mojave County Department of Public Health. Uh, tonight you are having the parent portion of RX360. What that is is prescription drugs and the 360 is a well-rounded approach for criminal justice. We got Kaida, the, the high intensity drug trafficking area. We got PAC360 and the partnership at drugfree.org. And they, these collaborate to bring us more well-rounded information. So we get to, um, they've done all this footwork and all we gotta do is present 39 slides, so yay. Um, I have been doing this for several years, about five years, and there's a couple of extra slides in here for a reason, they look the same, but the significance is these kinds of educational opportunities are making a difference in the community. They're making a difference in your families. They are making a difference for people who are not only recovering, but we hope that we can get it at the preventative level. And that's why we bring them into the schools when we can. Um, so this looks all wackadoo, this particular slide, but I wanted to give, this is real time statistics. You can always go on ADHS. Uh, if you just type in ADHS, it'll, it's the state health department, and they track opioid, some opioid facts. So um, there were eight from January to, uh, this, is, is, it, this is as current as January 8th. 8,140 suspected opioid deaths. Okay, so that's 8,100 um, deaths. 59,000 suspected overdoses. And going on down, what we're gonna learn about what naloxone is and what it does and why it's so important to be out into the community. But those are startling statistics. Just last time when they had it, there was only 1,000 suspected opioid deaths in, in 2017. And then by 20, 2021, 8,000. So it's still an increasing problem that we have. Look, this is Matt. She's the one that donated the water bottles and the little bracelets and tons of information here. So what today we're gonna learn why you matter, why do kids misuse prescription drugs, what you can do. One of the things that we are gonna talk, I'm just gonna keep drilling it in, drilling it in. Talk early, talk often. We gotta, your, your youth are little, how old are your girls? They're 10 and seven. Seven and 10. So we're gonna, you're gonna talk to them about healthy life skills, self-esteem, what to do when they're being bullied. And those, those kinds of conversations, those set the stage for having conversations later. You're not gonna talk so much as to a seven year old about using drugs, right? but you are gonna teach them how to deal with people on the playground that they're not getting along with or who, who they're, they're bullied by. So we wanna start those dialogues quite early and because math is so awesome, here is some information. This is about conversations at different levels, at different ages, at different stages. And I want you guys to take as much of this information as you think that you'll use I'm just going to, since you're parents, I'm just going to give you one right now. <laughs> Make sure you take half and read it. Um, so we're going to talk, or we want to promote talk, early talk often, and you're going to see some amazing statistics later on about why this is so effective. Safeguard your medications, and so each of you can take home a lockbox. Uh, I have more. If, if you think that you would use them, we're going to go into what these deterra bags are, safeguard your medications. Know how to spot youth use. If you suspect that your youngster is using or your young adult is using, what are you looking for? And then proper, proper disposal of your medications. And so, I, did everybody get one of these? Yes. So that is where you can safely dispose of your medications. And uh, Darlene, quiz. Do you remember how many pounds Bullhead City collected this month? No, I saw it. It was like uh, 86? Yeah, you said it a while ago. I did, I did. Um, 83 or 86? 80, 80 something, yeah. 
today I just got the report so that is awesome so all of these safe drop places these are making a difference and that's not packaging that's just the pills okay and just what the we pills. do with them is incinerate them so they don't go back into the water I, yes, I wonder about that back. because you know I thought about you know you're gonna run and flush it down the toilet you're gonna look at all what you do because we used to do that yeah we used to flush them down the toilet, and then we realized that it pollutes our water supply, right? Yeah, that's putting it right into the water. Yeah. Right, but we did the best we could with what we had. Right. And so now we have other options, which is awesome. Yeah. And something else, the they collect so, the, these drop boxes are so effective that there's not as much need for drug take-back days when the police used to come to the parks and you could take your medications and drop them that way they still have those events but they're not as necessary because each of the sheriffs you can just go monday through friday to five the oh. police and drop them and last month it not reported we dropped about 25 to fifty thousand dollars worth of um, liquid and patches fentanyl patches with the doTERRA bags oh yes and we happen to have some other too so yeah, yeah. Uh, street value, 25 to 50, yeah, because the, the like when you're talking liquid morphine or liquid, you know, that people use it in stages of life, they get huge quantities, and if that were in the wrong hands, right. the street value is just crazy. And shortly after I started doing these a few years ago, a wife came home, she came to our coalition meeting one day, and she told us this story about she found a patch in her husband's mouth. He was trying to get all of the fentanyl, never realizing he was gonna overdose and die. So, um, because that is a time release and when you try to ingest it like that, you're getting it all at once and it creates an overdose. So that was really sad. So it is very important to understand that prescription drugs are just as dangerous as street, illegal street drugs. And it doesn't seem like it, and we'll go into some of the reasons why later on, but they can be ju just as deadly. So some of the, the opioids that we're talking about, not sold, not separate, but these are the common ones. So can you guys name some opioids that you've heard of? Got one? Vicodin. Percocet. Percocet. Oh, Oxy. Oxy. Uh, okay, yeah, that's what I was trying to think of was the oxycodone. Yep, oxycodone, oxycontin, there's um... I mean, ibuprofen, wouldn't it do? I mean... No, not ibuprofen. Um, there's the uh, receptors in the brain, they, the drugs attach to different receptors. So what we're primarily talking about right now is opioids. Okay. And that is a pain reliever, but it's not an opioid. And the views that that'll do damage, but it's more liver damage to the liver of the kind that we're talking right now. Right, about. exactly right. This this will slow or stop your heart, your breathing. Boom, you're done. Oh, people don't think of the methadone, but it's illegally used continually. And I worked at a treatment center, and methadone was, and that's a very intense detox process too. It is definitely abused, and of course we've heard. So all of those top ones, though, see, those are all legally prescribed. The heroin we've mostly heard of, have we have all heard of heroin? That's the illegal one, but it is killing people as well. So I want to take a look at these statistics because these are amazing. One out of 13 eighth, eighth graders, one out of 13 eighth graders has taken a prescription not prescribed to them or used that prescription that was prescribed to them in a manner that wasn't prescribed, such as they were taking more than they were supposed to. Um, or they were taking somebody else, one out of 13. One, and, and the statistics go up as the grades go up. So we're talking about eighth, 10th, and 12th graders. And they've taken a pain reliever without a doctor's prescription in the last 30 days. Okay, so we're talking a good number of youth who are experimenting with opioids, not prescribed for them, or, or not 
taking their prescription and not using it correctly. And that happens month after month, really, right? Yes. Now, I'm glad you brought that up because this is an Arizona Youth Survey. And so for you, those of you who don't know what that is, that's a survey that is given in the schools every other year for 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. And they're administered in the schools so by the Arizona Criminal Justice Commission, the ACJC. They're done in the schools with the youth so that they can get a more honest answers to the questions without, you know, parental supervision. We're trying to not trick anybody just to be able to know what we're dealing with. Know what we're dealing with on the youth level. Okay, what are they admitting to? What are they doing? What are they using? And it's anonymous, so they feel more secure in answering. Yes, absolutely anonymous. And this, those, Arizona Youth Survey, the AYS, is extremely important for lots of different reasons. Not just drugs, but smoking cigarettes, vaping, obesity, uh, other, other, um, I think obesity, I should not really say that. Uh, is obesity on the, no. Okay, so glad I corrected myself, I am on film. Um, the, but other unhealthy coping skills. They don't know how to deal with the stress that they're facing, so they choose unhealthy coping skills. And it changes, okay. So, this says 2018 down at the bottom, I couldn't get it to change, but that's actually 2016. What we see here is one out of 15 eighth graders. So what we're seeing is eight, uh, there's a lower percentage of eighth graders, and that is huge. One out of 15 instead of one out of 13. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is an increase in 10th graders and 12th graders. So it was a total of 3% within the last 30 days. Now that is bumped up in two years time that is bumped up to 3.9%. 2020 Arizona Youth Survey was not um, handed out because of the whole COVID situation, so these are the last stats that we have. Hopefully when we bring that back, maybe we'll see a decrease, I hope so, because there's good reason to believe that parent education is key. So the more you talk, talk early, talk often. So is this uh, survey uh, administered online? No, it's not online. It's in the classroom. It's, it's, Are you it's, familiar with it? Yeah, paper, it's a paper survey. A paper survey. Mm -hmm. It is a paper survey. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, kind of a no-brainer, basically, but people who are addicted to alcohol are twice as likely to be addicted to heroin. Uh, three times more likely if they're using marijuana. Fifteen. But look at opioid painkillers. Are forty times more likely to have a, a to become addicted to heroin wow. that's huge because when you think about 75 percent of 70 to 75 percent of opioid of heroin users started out on a legitimate prescription prescribed by a doctor for a legitimate reason why would they give kids opioids does it, can anybody even think about why they would be prescribed an opioid Sports injury. Yeah. Absolutely. Sports injuries, car accidents, dental work. Those are reasons why. So, so taken properly and as prescribed, opioids are, are really a good drug to have, right? I mean, they're really effective drug to have until addiction sets in. And addiction can start within five days. So it's very important for, for everybody, not just youth, but for adults alike. Five days, uh, it, you could be starting the road to addiction on opioids, so careful. Now I have the additional risk of fentanyl, and we're gonna learn, does anybody know what fentanyl is? Has anybody ever heard of it besides Lori Duggins? It's a tranquilizer, correct? It's it is a tranquilizer. Used for horses and different types of oil. The carfentanil, I believe, is the elephant oh, tranquilizer. Yeah, mm -hmm. Very good, though. Oh. Very, very good. Fentanyl is 100 times stronger than morphine. Wow. So that, that's huge. That's cancer treatment, too. Who needs 100 times? And again, 
legitimate reasons for, to, for a doctor to prescribe these things, even fentanyl, as strong as it is. She mentioned cancer patients, chronic pain people. Um, you know, my mother-in-law had a fentanyl patch that was time release, so she had that on uh, for cancer. So that would be probably more like in a terminal case, right? Yes, but um, there's legitimate reasons to okay, prescribe yeah, that. Okay, yeah, no, I... by months of fentanyl abuse, addicted to the potent opioid that's killed more than 700 people in BC this year. I literally just did my mascara and I'm good to go now. Back in September, Katie agreed to tell me her story after covering the bleeding sores caused by drug use with me. Sorry. We don't want to give it all away here, people. Okay, so this is a two-minute video. Time I saw Katie, she was struggling to survive on the streets, transformed by months of fentanyl abuse, addicted to the potent opioid that's killed more than 700 people in BC this year. I literally just did my mascara and I'm good to go. Back in September, Katie agreed to tell me her story after covering the bleeding sores caused by drug use with makeup. She recounted how party drugs taken just for fun led to a search for bigger highs and ultimately hardcore fentanyl use. Every time I eat up, I know I'm taking her risk. I know that I, I might die, but like, it, it doesn't matter how many times I would do this, I'll use the next day because the withdrawals are so bad. By her own estimate, she would go on to overdose 17 times in five months, brought back from the break of death by the opioid antidote, naloxone. But she knew her luck could run out. I just like to take things one day at a time, but, you know, kind of just go with it and hopefully, you know, hope for the best. That was then. This is now. I never even thought in my wildest dreams that I could be happy like I am today. I'm feeling good. Katie is almost unrecognizable with her new look, two months clean and off the street, living at a residential addiction recovery center, something her family didn't want us to report until she stabilized. And something else we couldn't initially reveal, Katie's twin, Jesse, was also addicted to fentanyl. Just leave me alone. Jesse wanted no part of our original story, but now both say it helped change their lives. We were lucky to have that opportunity because, you know, I saw you that day on the strip, you know, and that doesn't happen very often. Katie and Jesse have been fentanyl free for 60 days, thanks to people who came forward. Treatment counselors, specialists in intervention, even a benefactor who's paying thousands of dollars a month for each of the twins to cover the cost of the private recovery facility. I never dreamed of this in addiction. I thought we were both going to die, and, and that's what I thought. And I would cry about it every single day. And be actually sitting here today and being in this treatment center with my sister, like, it's... Distance. It's made okay. clear that the best memories don't happen miles apart. Okay, that's amazing because let me tell you.
So for Katie, when I started sh uh, showing that, that little clip, she had overdosed 11 times. She lived on the street of Las Vegas and naloxone, which is an um, opioid antagonist. So the, she takes some kind of a drug, the opioid, it attaches to her opioid receptors in the brain. And then if she overdoses, as many people do, what they can be brought back by naloxone, which is an anti-antagonist, it then goes up to the, um, the receptor in the brain, boots off the opioid, and then it attaches because it is stronger for, for a time. The naloxone, the naloxone is stronger than the opioid. It does not last as long as the um, overdose can, so it's important for people to be around watching that person recover from that overdose, if at all possible, but there's other steps that they can take. So that's why naloxone is important, and she was brought back now 17 times before she hit recovery. Well, what's the name of the antidote? It's called, well, uh, the, it's called Narcan. Is the name brand. Is the nam, name, name brand. brand. And then naloxone is what? Naloxone? Naloxone. Okay. Yeah. And there is different forms of naloxone. There is an intramuscular, which is what we can get from Sonoran Prevention Works. We partner with them and they're happy to mail that out to you um, in case you need to have some of that on hand. The police use the nasal. They, it just goes straight up their nose. And what that does is, a person is overdosing, they get a blast of naloxone or Narcan, and they immediate, hope, the hope is they immediately go into withdrawal. So sweating, swearing, throwing up, but they're alive to tell about it, right? Like Katie, she was alive 17, 17 times later. The United States. But they're angry, their high is gone, and a lot of them want to fight. Yeah, a lot of them do want to fight, and um, you know, they're not grateful for you saving their life. They're bummed that you, but the wreck they're high, right? So yeah, that's how so many people die on the opiates is because getting high is close to dying, real close. So these are not. These are stimulants, they are not opioids, but they are drugs that we want people in the community to be familiar with what youth are actually using. So if you hear them talking about Adderall or Ritalin or Coracetin, now that's an over-the-counter cough syrup and they have, they have the, little, uh, the little tablets in the pill pot. It's over-the-counter, you use it for a legitimate reason, you're sick but kids are taking it for a high, and some are overdosing on that as well, and some sleeping medication. So just familiarize yourself with some of those brand names, Xanax, Valium, a lot of us have heard of those, Ritalin, we've heard of those. Something to beware. So why do you think our youth are using? Boredom. Boredom, yep. Peer pressure. Peer pressure? Depression. Depression, absolutely. Okay, that is actually, that's all very, very right, very correct. They want to get high, they want to have fun, they want to relieve their boredom, okay? They're feeling sad or down, which is your depression here, or could lead into depression. They're dealing with uh, the stress from home, they're dealing with the stress from school, they want to feel good, okay? These are the things that are revealed on the Arizona Youth Survey also. Kids, why are you using? And, and they honestly get to answer questions like this. Oh, here's a good one. Why are you not using? This is phenomenal. This is why we want to talk early, talk often. Because they don't want to disappoint their parents. So it is vitally important that we have these conversations early, often. It can harm their body. They're not interested in drugs. That is awesome. And based on the statistics that we looked at earlier, keep in mind, more youth are not using drugs than are. We're focusing on the ones that are, but please keep in mind, there are lots of kids who don't desire to, to experiment. It's because they're not interested. They don't want to hurt themselves. It, it's illegal, okay? And their parents would take away their privileges. So, 
You know, I love this parents would be disappointed in me, and you'll see why in just a minute. Key factor, 312 million pills were prescribed in Arizona. That's enough, that is enough for each of us to have a one week prescription of opioids. Remember this, five days to addiction. So that's an awful lot of opioids out there. Okay, for each of us to have a prescription for a week, where do they get them? Where do you think they get them? Family. Family. Medicine cabinet. Medicine cabinet. Family, friends, medicine cabinet. Okay? Um, they're huge medicine cabinets. That's what they were made for. Put, you put it in the bathroom and, and, you know, off you go. No, 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 no. Lockbox. And these are provided free, free of charge, so please take one on your way out if, if you need one. Please do. That's what they're there for. So they're getting them. They're, most of them are getting them from even their family. Oh yeah, I had that kind of thing too. The doctor gave me this, here you go. Not only is that illegal, that could be very harmful. A prescription is, is given to you by a doctor for you, for your height, your weight, your family history, and if you give it to someone else with the same ailment, that is actually illegal. So we want to not do that, we want to lock it up, okay? We do, if, the, if your youth is suffering from something, take them to the doctor for their own script. That's the safest legal thing to do. As we all know, mixing drugs and alcohol is a recipe for disaster. Okay. Miss Person, okay, so what do you, why do you think Youth are using prescription drugs. Why do they think that prescription drugs are not as dangerous as heroin? They're, those are made in a controlled and legal laboratory and they think that they're safe. They think they're safe. They're created in a lab. It's sanitized. It's not the jungles of Mexico or Asia or Iran, right? So, I mean, it's safe. FDA approved. Those are reasons which they really do sound legitimate why people wouldn't think that prescription drugs were as dangerous as they are, right? I mean, it makes sense. It's not accurate, but it does make sense. They're sanctioned. If you say I took a pill as opposed to I shot a needle in my arm, it's more socially acceptable, right? There's less stigma attached. Hey, FDA, good job. Thanks for doing a good job. Okay, this is huge. This is my exciting point. 50, so we saw that youth don't want to disappoint their parents, right? Yet, two years ago, 69% of parents, 69% of youth said their parents had not ever had the, t the drug talk with them. 69%. When 40% of the, the students were saying, I didn't know my parents, I didn't know my parents' point of view. They never had the, they didn't teach me resistance strategies. They never said anything about it. They did not know. 69% has dropped to 57% in two years. That's amazing. Parents are having the conversations with their kids and it needs to continue. So please tell a friend, tell a parent that it's time to have that talk. Okay, what can we, oh. Give me, give me some ideas for resistance strategies. What kind of suggestions could you make to your youth instead of them, if their friend approached them, hey, after school meet me at the park. I got, some, I got something to do. It'll be fun, you'll really like it. And your kid is exposed now to their friend using drugs. What could, we, what could you do to, to help them resist doing that with their friends. Give me any ideas. Well, with our kids, we said, make up your mind right now that you're just gonna say no. And just say no. We think that helped. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know that they said <laughs> <laughs> We hope it helps. They're doing well, yay. Uh, have legitimate responsibilities that they need to take care of in those times that they would otherwise uh, be, uh, Ooh. You know, 
So yeah, that three to six factor. When the, the kids have gone home from school but the parents aren't home from work yet, that three o'clock to six o'clock factor, yes, good one. Uh, you know, even whether it's chores or, you know, weeding or... Shit. Pets, yeah, babysitting, whatever. A simple one would be to just choose uh, different friends, you know, to just basically get away yeah. from those negative. Yeah, those people are not your friends. Yeah. They're not your friends. Absolutely. They're not your friends. Absolutely. And even we, I teach, a, I used to teach a class about this, about the resistance strategies. And even if they're friends, and they really are friends, they're all experimenting in that same realm. And sometimes you as a parent, we as parents, we don't necessarily want them to ditch their friends, but, they've, but we've got to equip them with strong resistance strategies so that they can walk away, maybe not sever the friendship, but definitely those activities that are unhealthy, unsafe, and illegal. Okay, so you guys did really good. Walk well, away. Most of the time, kids are doing drugs because they see their parents doing it. There's a lot that's, of... That's a lot of... That's them. a lot. And, I mean, it's not necessarily the friends, but because of the kids seeing their parents, you know, doing it as well, so... And another increase that we're going to be facing here is the legalization of marijuana. And as we've, many of us have heard, marijuana is a gateway drug, right? So if, well, if my folks or the adults in my life, not necessarily their parents, but another trusted adult, is smoking the reefer, you know, maybe it's not so bad. They see their parents or, or other loved ones getting, getting high or using drugs. And, well, they're not going crazy, but they just don't understand what is actually taking place. It just doesn't look that bad. So their exposure is a lot different today than it was in my day, than it was in my parents' day. Kids are faced with a lot of different um, situations today that we actually weren't faced with. And they're stressed out. I mean, there's also the women that are pregnant that are also, you know, doing drugs while they're pregnant. I mean, that's a lot that could affect the kids too. And not only that, I mean, parents are doing it in front of the kids. It's like second smoke, uh, hand smoke, you know? So it's like their kids are also getting high while they're, you know, they're doing it around the children, so. You couldn't be more right. I mean, so accurate. Um, that is a growing population. Pregnant neo, neonatal was one of the things I didn't show you there because that's not because that's a whole subject on in and of itself. But the neonatal statistics of drug use, of opioid use by the pregnant moms is is staggering. And <clears throat> on a personal note, with marijuana, um, I saw four generations in a car: little baby, mm -hmm. mom, grandma, and great grandma, all in a car. And they were smoking pot, and the little person was right there. So uh, it broke my heart. It, the little person was standing outside the car door, but you know what's going on. You know, they're doing that in the parking lot. So, yes, you're absolutely right. And there's and also it's, parents out there that they, you know, they're giving it to their kids. Like yeah, here. yeah, so it's like, it's, it's, it's not necessarily, you know, friends. I mean, it has a lot to do, too, as well. Huge amount is friends. Yeah. But remember, friends and family. Yep. Uh, so we're talking about these resistance strategies. What can they do? Walk away. They can walk away. Teach them those strong values. Remember, talk early, talk often. You're talking about pro-social basic life skills, uh, self-esteem, healthy living, those kind of things. They can make an excuse or a reason. No, no, I got to get home and do my chores. My mom will kill me if I don't have my chores done by the time she gets home from work. So excuse or a reason, make a joke. Hang out with others who choose not to use. You guys are, you guys are ace in it. <laughs> Avoid problem situations. Hey, meet me at the park after school. Nah, I gotta, I, I gotta go down this way. I gotta go to the, I gotta go to the store, okay? I've got, got practice after school. I got practice, yeah. I'm avoiding that situation entirely. Uh, Say no. One of the things that we teach uh, is put your hand up and say no. Start to walk away. 
that hand gesture, the body language is telling their buddy no, and sometimes you have to shout no. And it sounds goofy, but also what we do is have the kids practice these skills and role model those skills and give them skits to do. So it still feels plastic and it, and it looks kind of hokey, but the more familiar they come with these, with these strategies, the more likely it'll be that they can call on one from memory when they're faced with the situation. We saw the statistics of how many kids are using. It's likely they're exposed to it in one way, shape, or form at school. So they can change the subject, they can ignore it, or offer an alternative. No, let's put on the, let's go play basketball instead. No, I got this new video game we can watch. Oh, oh, I got this new CD or Netflix is showing blah, 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 blah. Okay, just offer an alternative. But we've got to get them, they got to feel safe enough to get out of the situation that they're in. Okay, so another thing, um, this is a rescue plan. Does everybody, does everybody know what a rescue plan is? Good. Okay, so a rescue plan is when you, in advance, you come up with a phrase or a word um, that, it, that you immediately know what you need to do. So I'll give you a scenario. Your son, your 16-year-old son, it goes to a party, and he notices his friend picks him up, everything is good, they're having a good time, and oh, his friend is drinking. His friend is drinking way too much. And now he's got to decide, do I get in the car with my drunk friend, my drinking friend, or what do I do? Well, of course we want them to call us, right? The rescue plan provides that. Couple rules with the rescue plan. They give you a call, you, your catchphrase is, uh, he calls you up and says, how's Aunt Sally's dog? You don't have an Aunt Sally, you don't have a dog, right? How's Aunt Sally's dog? Boom, you know he needs to be picked up. You get the address uh, and you, you're gonna come and get him. He's got it, the rescue plan is for his safety, but parents, no lectures, no nagging, no scolding, no complaint. We want them to call us. We want first and foremost for them to be safe. So a rescue plan is a huge relief for not only you, because there's that built-in safe alternative. Okay, I wasn't supposed to be here in this situation, but I am. Now how can I get out of it? Oh, I'll call mom and dad and ask about Aunt Sally's dog. Does that make sense? So something you really ought to practice before you need it, okay? Um, so we reviewed some of the ways that we can say no, that peer pressure, avoiding that peer pressure. So I do want to encourage you to all take one of the, oh, you all have one? Oh, yay, yay. And not only take it, but actually read it, look at it. What can you apply? You have a seven and a 10 year old. You're not gonna to talk to your 10 year old the same way you're gonna to talk to your seven year old, right? So just start these conversations, uh, the, the younger the better, the earlier and more often. So get the conversation started. It is up to us to keep our youth safe, right? So we, it's up to us. Use teachable moments, like for boys. Boys don't exactly usually like that direct conversation side to side when you guys are in the car together. Use teachable moments. Something comes up on the radio. Recently, in the, it, recently there was a, an overdose in one of the local high schools, okay? Um, use that, it, very sad, but use that as a teachable moment. So are you around kids? Have, do, do you know of any drugs that are going on in your school? Um, if you wanted to, to get drugs, do you, would you know how to do it? Is it available to you? Use those things. What are you going to do if your friend comes up? An article in the newspaper. Something comes on the TV. You see a, an ad in a magazine. Use those things. As, not lectures. Just uh, small, often conversations that you can use to direct the conversation. Um, Keep aware of those drugs that are out there. Remember, 
uh, Vicodin, Xanax, Percocet, Ritalin, Adderall, Methadone. What are you kids hearing? What are your kids saying? Listen to your kids when they're in the back seat and they think you're not listening. <laughs> Those are all things that you can do to understand what's going on in their world. And of course, age appropriate conversations. Anybody know how to spot it? Okay. Yay, you don't know. Missing pills. Count your own prescription pills. If you think you, oh, that doctor said he prescribed me 30, <clears throat> and you only have 10 left and you've had it for two days, you have some missing pills, it's time to investigate. Hopefully, they'll be locked in the lockbox, right? And you won't have that problem. Slurred speech, but you don't smell alcohol. That could be an indicator. Okay, so watch out for that. Deteriorating relationships with family. Teenagers are different. We're not talking about the normal rebelliousness that a teen is going through. We're not talking about the normal separating themselves from their families. We're talking about real attitude adjustments. We're talking about severe emotional shifts in the family uh, based on, you know, never wanting to be with the family. Well, part of that is they do want to be alone. They're learning who they are, what they like, what they want. They don't always have to be with the family. So they are spending a little bit more time alone. But all the time, oh, different group of friends, these are things that we need to, to be aware of. Catch a line. Ooh, that's bad. Abrupt change in their friends and groups' behaviors. Uh, that less open and less honest. You know, boys talk a lot less than girls do generally. Not always, but generally. Uh, but you're not looking for that as much as what is being said? How is, how is it being said? What are they doing? What is that drastic change? The drastic changes are what you're looking for. Even if the drastic change is very happy. It still shows, it still is a red flag. We want them to be happy, but we're talking about overly euphoric. What do you do when you spot it? What are we gonna do? Just throw it out there. <laughs> are we gonna talk about it? Yeah, talk about it, get some help. Get some help? Don't panic. Your good kid comes home wasted one night. Woo! Our first inclination is we're going to panic, right? Nope, not a time to panic. We, we don't need to panic. We probably will, but we don't need to. We want to stay as in control of the situation as we possibly can. We want to talk about it right away, but think about this. If your youth comes home drunk, is that the time to have a discussion about consequences and what's going on? Probably not. Tomorrow morning? Sure is. Next Saturday is too, off, too far off in the distance. So one of the things you got to do, don't panic. Let them sleep it off. Wake them up at 6 o'clock in the morning to, you know, loud banging or whatever you got to do. But talk right away at an appropriate time and in an appropriate way. Start talking and let them know how disappointed you are. Remember, 40% of kids don't want to disappoint their parents. That is huge. So let them know that they will be disappointed, they, uh, that you are disappointed. Set limits, rules, and consequences. These are important. Now these are important parents for you to understand and know and have a firm grasp on what those limitations and what those consequences are going to be. And I'll tell you, um, there are rites of passage. Sometimes parents will let, say, they'll let their kids have a drink when they graduate high school. So they're 18-ish. They've graduated though, they've worked all those years, it's time to give them a beer. Appropriate? That's for 
you, your family to decide. It is illegal, keep that in mind. But uh, rites of passage, those are kinds of things that, is that okay in your family? Talk about it. If it's not okay, talk about it. If there's, uh, if you catch them with pills or whatever and there's no consequence other than you're disappointed, you know, we got to set those, and we got to set those things before, before we're faced with the situation. Okay? Monitor. You think your kid, you think Johnny might be doing something, uh, you know, uh, check his backpack. Check his room. It's not spying. It could be saving his life. You've got to look at it that way. Uh, remember, we're not panicking, but we are investigating. We're keeping a grip on, on the situation. Please, get outside professional help if you need to. Please do that. It could save a life. You don't know how to handle it. You want to do something, you don't know what to do. You're too panic-stricken. Get them some help. Help is available. Okay, nothing you're going to be able to do about this, but this is a, this is a special vulnerability. Oh, not yet. Uh, if there is addiction in your family or alcoholism in your family, you're not going to be able to do anything about that to change it, but you can have the conversations, okay? Even if it's a grandparent who the kid is not even exposed to, it doesn't mean that addiction or alcoholism doesn't exist. It could. You can't do anything about it, but you can talk about it. Close friends who use drugs or alcohol, we want to monitor those friendships. Early first use, that's, you know, some early eighth graders. Eighth graders are experimenting, so the propensity for developing addiction or having addiction later on is pretty good the earlier or it's more common if you use early okay depression mental health issues that could be a real reality and a lot of times people are self medicating by using the drugs they feel better and what they don't have any idea is they have an, a diagnosed or an undiagnosed me mental health issue, concern. So uh, that's something to take into consideration. Those are special vulnerabilities. Watch out for those kind of things. Remember, we're here to help. We're, we're directing our kids. We want to keep our kids healthy and safe. It's not that we're trying to control their every movement. But this is deadly. People are dying from this every single day. Okay, so we have another video. This is parents. If you need to step outside the room, that's perfectly fine. I've seen it about 40 times, so I'm, I'm good. As a parent, I think most of you are concerned about all these illegal drugs, the heroin, the marijuana, uh, the meth, but you need to understand that the legal drugs are just as dangerous. They're getting it from your neighbors, your friends. It's not hard at all. If people are taking prescription drugs for non-medical purposes, they are not taking medicine. They're doing drugs. It's easy to start. Painful to stop. Prescription drugs are a prescription for a reason. If you take too many of uh, a prescription narcotic, you die. Chelsea was very well liked by her friends and by her teachers. Ronnie was the one down in Tennessee State to be the next player to come out of Tennessee State. Joey was extremely popular, just surrounded by friends. Mark was an athletic, fit-looking kid. Aaron enjoyed talking and debating with any and all people. The prescription pain pill problem is a huge epidemic. This is an epidemic. This is an epidemic that has infiltrated our young people. We never had a conversation with Joey about prescription drugs because we truly had no idea that there was any kind of recreational use going on. The first.
first time I started doing painkillers was when I was 17. I would steal pills from my friend's uh, mom. Her stepmom had scarred for Vicodin. That was like heaven. I went in her room and stole Vicodin every day. He would uh, ask to use the bathroom in other people's homes, and he'd go in there and go in their medicine cabinets and steal prescription drugs. These medications are available everywhere, every socioeconomic environment. Ronnie was a starting halfback, one of our best players. He has several scholarship offers. Ryan was very popular in the neighborhood. Ronnie was a neat freak, clean freak, always had his hair braided. When he got into the pill use, his mood changed. He changed, like, was it Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde? Ronnie's appearance really deteriorated, and it was really unlike him. I said, are you doing drugs? And my son looked at me with these eyes of, how could you even think of that, Mom? I was uh, walking up to football practice. My coach was walking towards me. He just had this crazy look on his face. He goes, you think they might find your brother? And I was like, to me, I was like goof. And I was like, oh, I didn't know he went missing. So I was like trying to make him like goof and all. And uh, he was like, no, Justin, seriously, they, he might have found his body. And uh, I was like, wait a minute. I was like, whoa, what? He's like, yeah, they, they found they discovered a body in an apartment in Southford. I never thought my son would take prescription drugs without a prescription. Parents often trick themselves up by asking a simple question. Are you using drugs? No. One has to be able to say, I'm seeing some signs here that concern me. He was a little bit more argumentative. We thought that was maybe hormones. The person has what we call pinpoint pupils. Literally, the pupils look like a pinpoint. She slept odd hours. We didn't know why he was sleeping so late. If I wasn't able to get high, then I didn't want to get out of bed because, you know, the physical withdrawals. We were missing tinfoil from the kitchen, missing spoons. We'd find bands that were cut in half. Straws. There were a lot of charges coming on the credit cards. We thought that there was somebody stealing money out of her account. That's probably a pretty good clue that there's something going on. Joey was pretty upset with his roommates and were spending all the money on medication. Had I known that the medications that they were taking were so dangerous, I would have told them, you're not even going back to that place. If you feel something's going on, you gotta investigate. I thought it was just a phase. We already when we were in high school, and it's just sort of a phase you go through as you go you experience life and grow out of it. And I thought he was on that track. Joey had been found. And he was unconscious. He had all these medications that he had just received from his doctor. More than likely, he questioned, snorted it. We're just being completely hit blindly by, you know, a situation we had absolutely no understanding of and um, no notice of. And in the meantime, my husband's in the house. I'm out front in the, in the front of the house, just, you know, wondering what we're, we're dealing with here. And so finally, Joe just came out and said, he's gone. I was downstairs getting ready for work. Cookie told me she couldn't get Mark back. Mark was powerful and had the nickname in some circles of Tank. I reminded her that what she had to do was get a cup of water and splash him with it and stay out of his way. And she told me uh, it was different. We found a clear plastic bag with loose pills. I'm not sure if he even thought he was doing drugs, and I know that sounds crazy, but it's not like he was heroin or cocaine. We followed the ambulance to the hospital. A few minutes later, uh, someone came in and, and told us that Mark was dead. We never thought that was a possibility. I had no idea that kids were abusing this. I came home one night and saw the basement light on and went up to the window and uh, my son was uh, crushing and snorting the pills. We would find pills in the shoes, in the jackets that are hanging in the closet, in the pockets. I found some pills hidden under this cushion. They were in socks. I never checked my kids' socks. He took the light switch plate off and put them in there. Look everywhere. Is it in the basement? No. You're doing the right thing as a parent. I 
would question Chelsea, and she would always assure me that everything is fine and nothing's wrong. Kids don't want to get in trouble, so they're going to tell you exactly what you want to hear. There was always something down deep inside that said to me, something's wrong. You doubt yourself because you wonder if you're making a bigger deal out of something. You know, maybe deep down my parents knew that I was high. You can't always believe your child. Their lies get bigger when they're trying to hide substance abuse. I knew her inside and out, and I remember Chelsea as the little girl that she used to be. I looked at her, and I always saw the most beautiful son in the world. It was very difficult to think that she would be lying to me, which she was. She was out using and abusing prescription drugs. Long-acting agents like OxyContin are meant to be delivered in the body over a period of hours, if not a day. If they're chewed, crushed, and snorted, you get the entire dose at one blast, and the body's not ready to accommodate that. You will stop breathing. We need to call the police. But what are the neighbors going to think? Put all of that aside and focus on what's important, as difficult as it may be. Families can't get too caught up in the idea that, uh, oh, there may be an arrest, some charge, or my son or daughter, uh, they could be in jail. Um, they, they could be in the morgue. The law saved my life. If my mom hadn't called the cops on me, I don't know where I would be right now. It was the most difficult thing to do, to call the police on your, on your own child. It was horrible. I have gone from putting importance on things like what college are you going to get into to just celebrating the fact that she lied today. Um, she's doing very well. She's clean and sober. She's productive. She's sweet. And I have her back, and I'm thankful. And it's wonderful. Aaron had spent the night at a friend's, and they found him blue and non-responsive. They took him to a local hospital. He was using Vicodin, uh, which we found out through his toxicology, what was in his blood system. I witnessed him have two heart attacks in ICU. He had scalp, he had pneumonia, he went through seizures. The doctor was explaining to us that he was going to die. We held his hands on each side, and we started crying. And he just laid there. People use the medications in an abusive way, not knowing what the full consequences are, and somebody ends up here. Within 24 hours, Aaron had opened his eyes. Parents are the first line of defense in terms of prescription drug abuse. You gotta sit your kids down. You just gotta tell them about the severity of the problem. There's a number of steps that you can take. Educate your child and yourself very early. Anybody who feels that this can't happen to my child. <coughs> it could happen to your kid. Make sure that you don't have excess pills in your home. Keep your medications locked up because you're never gonna notice if something's fine. What my mom does is she has these take home pee tests that I gotta take. No, I wanna keep my mom proud of me. I don't wanna let her down. You need to have the conversation with them about drug and substance abuse. And you need to include prescription drugs and guide them so they're able to get through their high school years and into college and through their college years drug free. Have this conversation before it's too late to have this conversation.
but you see the parents' reactions. You see how it affects the families. The kids don't want to do that to their, to, they have no idea uh, what the consequences could really be. So, uh, I heard something huge in here. Parents, we are their first line of defense. We, oh, we don't want to forget about that. We are us and trusted adults, okay? What else, what else did you hear in there? Things to look out for, perhaps. Remember we were talking about what you could see, what you would identify, some of those behaviors? We talked about the moods and relationship changes. Missing, moods and relationships. Missing pills. Missing pills. Missing money, money also. Money. Um, the kid who was a neat freak, and now he's all disheveled. Uh, are you doing drugs? No, mom, I'm not doing drugs, right? These, these kinds of behaviors that we see, uh, even the dad, okay, this is where we want to step in and um, be more aware, which you're all doing right now. Well, I don't think my son was really doing drugs. I mean, it was, I don't even know if he knew he was doing drugs. I know that sounds kind of ridiculous, but see, it's not like it was heroin right, or it's something illegal. These were prescribed there by that, that um, false, false thinking. It's a prescription. It's safer, okay? Anything surprising? I like the drugs tucked in the light socket. Yeah. yeah, the lights up, the sock, the socks. And that, that man who found that I never thought to look at my son's socks, he was an officer. He was a detective. It, this this t touches everybody, all races, colors, creeds, religions, socioeconomic. This is crossing all the barriers. Rich, poor. Rich, poor. So what do you think these families wish they would have done? Talk early. Talk early. Talk often. You're their first line of defense. You suspect something. Okay, count your pills. Look at your money. Uh, look at their behaviors. Hey, I, you don't even have, we don't even have to accuse them of doing drugs. Hey, I'm noticing some changes in your behavior. Let's talk about it. We don't have to be accusatory. We do have to let them know we are concerned and we do want to know, you know, remember those consequences before we set it up. Because if they are, we want to get to it as soon as, as quickly as possible. Remember, the younger the use, the first use, uh, we, want to, we want to watch for that later on in addiction. So that was pretty powerful. It got me a couple of times. I've seen it about 40 times. I thought I was over it, but I'm not. Okay, so learn about the medications. Let, let's just shout them out what you heard today. Some of the medications that are out there in the schools. Xanax. Xanax. Vicodin. Adderall. Adderall. Ritalin. Vicodin. Ritalin. 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 Quercetin, Skittles. High yep. blood pressure cold medicine, Skittles. Mm -hmm. Valium, Percocets, Methadone, Heroin. Oxycontin, oxycodone. Establish your family policies. That's up to you. And there is tons of resources that you can, that are out there and available. If you go to Drug Free Arizona Kids .org, there's contracts that you can print out and and sign. Make your family contract. Set up the consequences. Let them know. Well, mom, you never told me. Oh, it's right here. You sign this contract, right? Very important. Um, it, it may or may not, but at least you're talking about it. They're thinking about it. They know you're serious about it. And you're serious because you want them to live. Because like that one guy, he said, it could be in the morgue. You're worried about an arrest? They could end up in the morgue. These are real families. Is that video available? for family use or? We could, um, well, see. I mean, I know there might be some <clears throat> copyright stuff, of, of, you know, or use, you know, intellectual property stuff, but I'm just wondering if it's available and. It's a great question. You could find out from Drug 
drugfreearizona.org. It's on their website. It's on their website. So, so you can access it. You can access it right there on the, the, the brochure. It gives you the website right there. Okay. And it's there's awesome. youth versions too. So if you want to sit down and you wouldn't want to show this one to your youth. Okay. A family, a family members, adults. But there's a youth counterpart to this video. Okay. She's and, a nicer mom than I would have been. I, I would. My, my team would have seen yeah. it. Uh, the the <laughs> the youth version the youth version shows the kids perspective it doesn't show that these kids actually died but it shows that they their struggle with it why they started what happens when they're not using it you heard that one say if I didn't have it physically I was in so much pain I didn't get out of bed every day so um, it talks about that from the kid's point of view. Oh, not Aaron, but uh, the family members of Aaron do get up there and speak. So um, they just don't see the graphic part. Take action. So we're talking about counting your pills, keep track of your refills, uh, don't leave your prescription drugs in the medicine cabinet. Just think about when you used to lock your medication, I mean, the cleaning supplies under the kitchen sink with those little, those child locks. That's what these are for, okay? Please use your, utilize your resources. That's what they're here for. Take action. So we talked about the Dropbox. You all got a Dropbox uh, locations. Any police station, uh, sheriff station, there's a few pharmacies in town that now have them. Um, the, they take the medications, sharps, and liquids. There is a pharmacy in Bullhead City called De Defleet, and they take sharps, which is um, which is great because that's the only one I know of in town. Do you know of another one? No, but no one takes sharps. So yes, D Flat Pharmacy does. Which one is it? D Flat. D E E F L A T. D Flat. D Flat Pharmacy. So, you know how they dispose of the I think they're incinerated also. Yeah. There is a machine that can be bought, and I want our county to get one uh, so that we could, you know, it, because it actually burns it at such a high temperature that it, it de you know, there's nothing. It actually, yeah, yeah, it, it actually it, burns it. Really, it's, yeah. You know, iron would work. Yeah, and it you comes out in a little tiny little. Yeah. yeah. It's important. It's important for us to all know because we all know nobody takes sharps, right? So this is a lot of times what the, the prescription drop boxes look like. At Bullhead City Police Department, you walk in, there's a hole in the counter, a nice lady will greet you during business hours. Are you guys open for that? Yeah, just 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Okay. Yeah, you can bring, you, we give you a Ziploc bag if you don't have one with you, and you have to put it in the Ziploc. And we don't take the, the packaging, just the pills. And this is, there's no questions asked. So it is not just your, it's your unused prescriptions, unused medications, your expired ones that are in the medicine cabinet, your pet medication. It could be vitamins, but we want all of these unused drugs off the streets and unavailable for our kids. Okay, so please keep that in mind and then D-flat is, uh, available for sharps and liquids. If you if you can't get to a drop box, if you have medications at home, use something gross, coffee filters, kitty litter boxes, get dispose of them in that way. Here's another thing, and this is available to you also. This is a deactivization bag. So there's a charcoal lump in here, you add water to the bag. You pour in your prescriptions and it deactivates the opioid. Makes so yes, the, the, the pill may still be in there, but it, it's, it's ineffective now. So these are available to and you. And so what would you do with that bag after you used it once? Well, yeah, then you can dispose of it. Oh, okay. It's uh, not going to harm anybody because it's like the charcoal is like how you, we used to hear about pumping the stomach with charcoal. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they still do it, but that's a, a less invasive version of that. Mix your medications with something yucky. Don't pour medicine down the drain like we used to. We used to flush our extra pills down the toilet, but there's these, these, the drop. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
Dropbox location. So take action. Um, locally, we have Mojave Mental Health. We have Southwest Behavioral. We have a new treatment center, but it's for adults. It's up on the part uh, on Silver Creek Revive. Uh, Summer's Dawn. There's also a um, Kingman Outpatient, Kingman, Kingman Recovery Unit, Kingman Observation Unit. It's on Beale Street in Kingman. A little bit of a drive, but um, definitely worth it if you suspect if your kid is acting weird. If your kid just need, if you just need to go there, it's a 24 hour, 23 hour, 59 minute observation chair, and then they'll guide you through the process of what needs to happen next. But we do have resources available. Even if the child's high and you're scared and you don't know what to do, you can drive up to that KOU, that mm -hmm. Kingman Observation Unit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions? Any anything? Did you learn anything new? Yeah. Yes. Yes, what did you learn? <laughs> well, um, I didn't even know that there was that many pills out there. The I, 312 million? Or just the kids I mean, are so exposed? When I hear about pills, to me it's, you know, I pass. It doesn't matter what it is, you know, because that's what I heard, that, you know, that you can get a, you know, you can die from it. So I'm over here thinking any kind of pill. You know. I'm well, even afraid to even take vitamins yeah. and take a another prescription prescription on top of that one. And, you know, yeah, just, How, what is that interaction going to look like? Yeah. yeah. I literally have a brochure at the police department called Harmful Interactions if you're interested. And it'll show you what medications mix with what to cause a problem, you know, so that you can feel a little better about when you're about to take something right. so you're educated. So it's like the ibuprofen, you know, uh, doctors are prescribing ibuprofen for painkillers and knowing that that can damage your, you know, your insides. So it's like, what pill can you take that would be okay for you? Okay, and so um, just so you know, that is extended use uh, ibuprofen, just like opioids, there's a legitimate reason for that prescription. Okay, it's when we abuse, when they're abused or misused, that it becomes a problem. But just so you all know, uh, about 20, 20 years ago in Germany, they conducted a study and they discovered that 600 milligrams of ibuprofen mixed with 200 milligrams of sodium naproxen, which is your a leave, the main ingredient in a leave, is more effective in reducing pain than an opioid. 20 years they've been working on that study. So and now they're finally bringing it out in an over-the-counter drug. Oh, they, cool. there's a, a maker bringing it out right now. Yeah. yeah. We've been preaching it for so long, it's been crazy. Exactly. Yeah. But there are alternatives, like, like these are, we talked about it, these are given for a legitimate reason. It's when they're misused and abused that they become a problem. And don't forget the five days. That was huge. Uh, I don't know. I was surprised I about that. I would Google it. Yeah. Now, Let's see if I they have, um, they don't, uh, physicians don't prescribe as many opioids now, but uh, you know, it's kind of too late for the people who are already addicted, but they, you know, there is a solution and now they're making prescriptions like three days long. So there, there's, there's precautions being taken now. They didn't know what they didn't know. Now we know better. Now we're doing things differently. So all of us together, collectively, us parents, educators, teachers, we want to get this information out and so if, um, you know, the, the lies, uh, it, how much denial we can be in as parents because we don't want to see that. We want, those moms wanted to believe their kids, but deep down, now they wish they would have done something differently. So we want to, you know, prevent that from happening in our families. But does anybody have any questions? Is there anything I can help you with? Any resources? 
that we or the police department can provide for you. We are available. So please take my car if you think of any questions that you may have or you think of a parent who might benefit from something like this or needs a lockbox, please just give them my number and they can come and pick one up. I'm just right there on Hancock um, and these are available to you. So um, thank you all for, for coming. I really appreciate your, your time and attention.